Welcome back. This is the Ed Up International Podcast. This is episode eight. And rather than trying one thing at a time, we've decided to try a whole bunch of new things with a new episode. If you remember from episode seven, we were introducing today CVS Education Insights with Jesse. We've also decided to try a video episode. So I'll be dropping the video link into the show notes. Uh, but today's episode is a fantastic episode, something very close to my heart. This is curated video content and alumni ambassador programs. This is a combination of the two. So it's a very unique solution with Robert Sovic of Harpier and a great international education consultant, Nicole Barbe, as our guest co-host. I had a nice little chat with Robert beforehand about Czech Republic and Slovakia, because I had lived and worked in Slovakia. And then I came onto the episode and said, Robert, you're from Slovakia. And he said, no, Czech Republic. So my apologies there. And Robert was a hockey player for Division Three Hobart. And he let us know that Hobart would be playing on Saturday night in the national championship game. Uh, so we didn't know the result when we recorded the podcast, but I watched the game last night. So congratulations, Hobart. You are Division Three national champions in hockey. So let's get right to a quick teaser with Jesse, Sevis Education Insights with Jesse. Now we're going to show just a quick 90-second teaser for the full six-minute deep dive that's at the end of the episode. Uh, please listen to the full episode. It's fantastic. And then the last six minutes are the first installment of Sevis Education Insights with Jesse. Uh, today is a very close look at funding documentation and the F-1 visa interview. So you're probably hearing from some State Department officials that your applicants do not need to go to their visa interview with the documentation of their funding. Uh, Jesse's going to talk about that because yes, often students are being asked to show the documentation of the funding. So it's very important that DSOs and PDSOs set them up to be ready to show their funding and even to show their scholarships. All right, Jesse's gonna have a May 8th workshop called Everything You Needed to Know About Funding. If you have any interest in talking with him about that or his other F1 and J1 workshops, visit sevisseducation.com or send him an email at jesse at sevisseducation.com. All right, Jesse, take it away. Jim, I thought I wanted to start out my uh, first discussion today with my opinion or a suggestion about best practices when it comes to documenting student funding. Now, granted, most of us as DSOs, we're not financial accountants. We don't have backgrounds in finance. And we are not supposed to be doing a deep dive into an analysis of what type of documentation our students have. Nevertheless, our school should have in place, and I know most of us do, good practices for what we will accept as documentation of funding for our sources. Thank you, Jesse. Fantastic teaser for today's See This Education Insights with Jesse. That comes at the end of today's episode eight. Please give a full listen to episode eight with Robert Sovic of Harpier and Nicole Barbe. And then at the end, you'll get a nice Sevis Education Insights with Jesse. This is our first installment of Sevis Education Insights with Jesse. It's all about funding documentation at the visa interview. We hear over and over from top officials that perhaps our candidates for the visa don't need to take their funding documents to the visa interview. Jesse is arguing that, yes, please prepare your students for that F1 or J1 visa interview to take their funding documents to the visa interview. See this education insights with Jesse, the last six minutes of today's podcast. And now let's get to the podcast. All right, thank you, Jesse. So this is Ed Up International episode eight. Got a fantastic episode today. I'd like to start by introducing our guest co-host. She is Nicole Barbe. She is a fan of languages. She loves languages. Can you tell us about an interesting challenge you had with your friend regarding languages? Oh, yes. Thanks for having me on, Jim. Um, so 
really my love of languages is what brought me to where I am today in my career and working in international education. And um, when I studied abroad, I had a really good friend who was learning French at the same time as me. And we both were really passionate about languages. And we got to talking one day and that talk turned into kind of a competition and trying to one up each other on who had a better French language level. And that uh, turned into a competition of who could actually learn more languages. So I did my, I accomplished my goal of learning French, which I have a pretty good level at. Um, and since then I've started learning at least five other languages, including Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, uh, Japanese, and Polish, but unfortunately, haven't been as successful in, in those languages as I have in French. And I think he's actually beating me. He learned Arabic and has been studying Russian. So he's, oh, wow. he's got at least a language and a half on top of me. Oh, that's interesting. So I think I have to bring in, I had one weird incident in Morocco where I was speaking with an American guy in English. He was speaking with the Moroccan guy in Arabic, and then the Moroccan guy was speaking with me in French. So we had a conversation going around in a circle. So <laughs> that's my language story. All right. So I know, Nicole, you're consulting in international recruitment, international student recruitment. You're fantastic at it. You and I have presented together in the past. Uh, how can people reach you, Nicole, just so, so we know if anybody does want to reach you? You're on LinkedIn, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I am on LinkedIn. You can find me there. You can message me there. Um, I, my email address is barbenicole at gmail.com. Um, but maybe you can put that up. Okay, I'll do that in a bit. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. So, Nicole, you're going to take a lot of lead when we do get to talking with Robert. So let's move on to our, our guest today. He is Robert Sovic. He is the founder and director of Harpier. That's harpier.com. They've got some fantastic solutions in student recruitment, not just international student recruitment, but student recruitment. And that's with curated content and alumni ambassadors. So this is always intriguing for me because I've always wanted to do curated content style things with videos and alumni ambassadors on one side, but I never thought of putting them together. Um, so this is Robert Sovic. He's living up in Northeastern Pennsylvania in the Poconos, a great place to go canoeing and whitewater rafting. Robert's from Slovakia. Unfortunately, there are no hockey rinks. Czech Republic. Oh, I Robert's to, from Czech Republic. Right okay, right there. that's right, right. Oh, it's, it's the reason fun, I got that wrong is because we had a conversation that I had been in Slovakia and you were in Czech Republic. So I love Prague. Yes. Robert's from Czech Republic, no hockey rinks in Northeastern Pennsylvania. So tell us what sport you took on to replace hockey. So, so in order to, to replace a need for some physical activity, um, actually staying pretty, I think on topic with the international, uh, even though I'm not as, not as cool as Nicole with all the languages, but I took up, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and, and it's actually kept me occupied and I think calm in the head, especially during tougher weeks. So yeah, I've been taking a route to improve myself in other ways than just focusing on my work life and my family life. Uh, and, uh, and it's been pretty, pretty good for me. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's what's going on right now. All right. And you came to the U.S. as a hockey player at uh, Hobart and William Smith up in western New York State, up in the Finger Lakes region. Can you tell us a little bit about your international student journey? Absolutely. With pleasure. So I actually ended up at uh, at HWS or at Hobart and William Smith uh, by accident. I'll just say it how it is. I was being recruited through my uh, teammate back in Prague. Uh, I was being recruited to go Division I uh, at uh, Division I program at UMass Lowell, but uh, because I played a couple of professional games, I was deemed ineligible by the NCAA. And so um, I was looking for alternatives and uh, because the coaches knew each other, I ended up at, at Hobart and uh, it was the best thing that happened to me. I was a pretty decent player, but I don't think I was, I was uh, that caliber 
of a player. Uh, and I don't think I would play as much in, in Lowell, especially because they were runner ups in the championship the, the year when I was coming there. Um, and I ended up at Hobart, which which opened uh, tremendous opportunities for me, not only on ice, but off ice and especially in my my post graduate graduation life. Right. And now Hobart, I know, traditionally was a lacrosse powerhouse, but I know their hockey team was pretty good also. Yeah. Last year, they, um, yeah, that's actually a perfect timing for this because last year they were national champions and yesterday they won their semifinal game um, and they are playing uh, in their final game tomorrow. Uh, oh. Obviously, this podcast is going gonna, is gonna to be released probably later, so we will know who won the championship, but uh, but our team is, is there. So, um, oh, wow. yeah, so it's I'm a pretty gonna, big gonna... deal for, for the school. <laughs> I'm going to look for that game on ES- ESPN plus then. So it should be on there. So uh, yeah, it's, right. it's, it's somewhere okay. and it's definitely on the NCAA <laughs> website, but yeah. All right. Like we... All right. That's great. Okay. All right. Let's go Hobart William Smith. All right. But let's get into the meat of what we're here for today. Could you tell us and introduce, uh, in, introduce us to Harpie? Yeah, absolutely. With pleasure. So I think it's good to start with the full context uh, of where it comes from. And so I was an independent educational consultant for more than a decade. It started with uh, me being still in school and and uh, people basically from my country, my high school, and um, they started to come to me asking questions about the, about the applications and how did you take your steps and how did you navigate your process? And I started helping them uh, but at that time, it was probably a number five priority. Um, so I still had to figure out how to finish my studies, uh, how to get a job, uh, how to still stay on the team because it was competitive. And uh, I didn't really think much of it. But more and more people started coming to me asking these questions. And I figured that I can maybe set up a more organized way to um, to help them. And so when we were, uh, or when I was in college, we started with a friend actually who also went uh, through this similar process. He studied, uh, he studied uh, in, in Wisconsin and in said Norbert and played football, uh, like actual football. We're not talking soccer. We're not uh, doing soccer versus football. He actually played football. And, uh, and we, we started together as this little, little project that uh, then ended up, long story short, me leaving my full-time job in New York City, um, where I was working in, in uh, business strategy for a software as a service company or provider or a branch of a, of a, of a bigger company. And, uh, and since then, I've been um, helping families navigate their journeys. And we really, because we try to really focus on the individuals, we're trying to kind of see what really uh, can make the students tick, where they would actually have a great experience in contrast with a good experience or a bad experience. And so we really got in the depths with conversating about values, conversating about uh, goals and yada, yada. And uh, throughout this time of actually spending these thousands of hours, we were um, trying to figure out where there are some gaps where we can be um, creating as much positive impact as we can. And we ended up uh, through a lot of lot of trial and error, uh, we ended up with a solution where um, we came up because we were developing technology solutions since 2016, but some basic ones. But we came up with this recommendation system that curates stories of outcomes. And we started doing that at first manually. Uh, and we did it for the students and parents making a decision of, do I enroll at institution X? Do I enroll at institution Y? And what is the reason for it? Where can that institution take me? And we're not necessarily predicting the future or anything like that, but we, through this knowledge and through the processes that we went through, we're able to at least give a little bit more tangibility in terms of the next step for the student and parent. And so that's when it clicked and we actually made it into a technology solution, technology platform that also helps institutions to boost their enrollment, boost their, especially their yield, uh, because stories are 
something that we as people we we resonate with in general but if they are made in a way or if they are curated in a way that they that we can relate to somebody about whom the story is told then it's a powerful tool and then it can really um, drive decision making and drive enrollment for the for the institutions all right um and i think you're going to do a hands-on demonstration and i'm going to as you go and start sharing your screen i'll tell the listeners if you're listening to this as a podcast and you actually want to see the demonstration right now you can stop the podcast go to add up international facebook page go to the pod page for add up international or go to my linkedin site and i'll drop the link to see the video in there and then uh, as you as you share your screen and start going through this, I'm going to turn most of this over to Nicole because she knows you better. Um, Nicole, do you have any questions that will set this up since you know Harpier and you know Robert better than I do? Yeah, um, Robert, can you first of all just give us a little bit of background about the name Harpier? What is what does that represent? I see a picture of an owl. So yes, absolutely, with pleasure. Actually, I didn't even expect the the question, but Harpier is is an important part of kind of where this whole thing comes about. So we're gonna go a little bit to the world of mythology because Harpier is uh, supposedly uh, Merlin's familiar or Merlin's helper, and uh, we're talking about the old wizard Merlin from the uh, uh, Arthurian uh, tales. And the analogy behind Harpier is that Merlin was uh, helping Arthur and Harpier was helping Merlin. We think about ourselves as the helpers to counselors, as helpers to basically people that are on the front lines who are dealing with the enrollment or other activities. And, uh, and we are there to support them at every step of what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so this analogy, uh, because I am, I am, yeah, weirdly into mythology in a big way, uh, this kind of name came up from some book. You cannot really find Harpier anywhere else other than uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth. Uh, where Harpier there, though, is not, not in the context of, of uh, Merlin's Owl, rather as one of the three familiars from the Weird Sisters. But, uh, but back to the analogy, we just are the helpers to the helpers. You serve, you serve admissions and recruiting staff at universities, and then they serve the students. That's exactly it. And we, we pride ourselves on it. I've been I think very very fortunate that I was able to deal with um, great people and we have to say because this is one of our core whys um, there is a crisis in, in regards of um, counselors being overwhelmed uh, with lack of resources lack of time lack of energy and this is not me putting blame on you know the leadership or anything like that but this is just the fact of life and we are absolutely focused on uh, providing those people who put themselves first. They never put anybody or uh, who, I'm sorry, let me say it again. They put others first, they put themselves last and we want to support them because of that. And we feel like we can do that in an efficient way. All right, so we're ready. So, so we're ready to go. Let's see this demonstration. Again, yes. those of you listening as an audio podcast, if you wanna see the demonstration, Go on Facebook, look up the EdUp International podcast page, and I'll have the link dropped in there. Uh, but Nicole, go ahead. You can start asking your questions. But this is great for me because I'm the kind of person that has all these 20 minutes recordings of interviews with alumni, and I end up using only two minutes of it in info sessions, and I've got 18 minutes of great stuff that I never use. So I'm really excited to see this. Sorry. Right. Okay. So Nicole, what questions do you have as he starts showing us his, his solution here? Yeah. So Robert, as you mentioned, you know, we're talking about bridging a gap between um, the admissions office and students and parents and alumni. So how is this platform bridging that gap? For us 
So what we're trying to do is we are trying to individualize the enrollment process for the student and parent on behalf of the institution. So this, what we're seeing here, and I will, obviously it's, it's a demo. Uh, it is all branded for the institution and we will not use any specific names, even though we will use a specific example. Uh, what we're trying to do is to provide an experience that can resonate for that given student or parent, whoever goes through it and can really provide the right uh, context of um, answering the question of why should I enroll here? And, um, that's why we chose to, number one, individualize the process. That's why we curate it. That's why we start with that person. We can get to that in a second. But then um, we want to really make sure that the experience is as resonant for the student and parent in order to make themselves or make, make them see themselves in, um, at the school. They can see their potential outcome and they can kind of follow that uh, in that way. So, so at this point, they've filled out a request for information form that you've set up. So you're asking them desired major, potential career field, and some other activities they might want on the campus. Yes, and this goes both. Uh, this goes in two ways. One, uh, we are able through APIs, we can gather information from the applications of that given given student. We are, I think primarily focused on the yield yield phase of the of the cycle of the funnel. Um, and so we might directly gather that type of information. And also we allow individuals to then supply extra information based on their desired major, career of interest, campus activities. We usually do other other uh, factors such as uh, high school. This is for undergrads, so it can be high school or hometown so that we can really create that level of resonance that uh, would show the potential future for the for the students and parents. Not predict the future, we're not predicting the future, but we are showing uh, a little bit more tangibility of why enrolling here versus at another place. So you're nope. building a profile of students and then you're creating a match? How How is... How is That's the, exactly the platform correct. then taking that profile and what do you so doing? So what we do is uh, here with this with this uh, test user profile, we have these types of interests. And based on that, the user is provided with a specific story. And bear with me here in terms of the design. This is a demo place and we are not using concrete photos or names, uh, but what the user sees is general information about, about uh, the person. It links to the LinkedIn just so they can do their potential further research. But mainly what it does is curate not only the right person, that's number one, based on these fields, we are relatable. Uh, this person uh, and the user are relatable, but uh, also the content that is then distributed to the user is also curated. Now we're in the enrollment context, which means that students, parents are asking questions in terms of, or in a way of, uh, why do I enroll here? What is the value of enrolling here? What is my return on investment? And the system here runs uh, runs us through it and curates pieces of information that are the most relevant in the way that is um, as digestible as possible. So for example, with this specific uh, person, there is a long form video that has been that has been shot that Jim has uh, provided for this for this example, and the system uh, on the back end actually takes the most relevant pieces and then curates them for the user. So I'm not spending time on learning everything about this person, but I am related to this person in some way. So now I care, and now I am going to spend some time. And because we're on video, it's not going to play, but uh, not going to play audio. But there is um, there is an actual person who then provides that context in detail in 
relation to um, yeah the mostly asked question. The person who majored in that program who's now working in the field. So it's definitely exactly. totally related to that. Sorry, go ahead, Nicole. I cut you off. Yeah, no, I think we we're gonna we we're gonna say the same thing. So what we're looking at then is an alumni who is very similar to this prospective student in terms of maybe field of of study, maybe where they came from, if they're international, it could be they're from the same country, or they're both interested in hockey, for example. And now they're seeing somebody who went through this journey at this institution and they're able to see how that experience played out for that person yes. and how they've succeeded and how studying an institution has helped them succeed and what their outcomes are. Is that? And that's the core part. How did this institution help me to be a better person, help me to get a job, and all of those very particular questions. So in this case, uh, this student, uh, specifically this international student, she is talking about the value of, of, uh, of Turo and uh, the value in regards of the curriculum, then in regards of the network and the post-grad opportunities, and also the applicability of the coursework into uh, in her job, which are some of the core, most distilled, but core questions that uh, students uh, are and should be asking when they're when they're contemplating on where they're contemplating about where are where they're going to enroll, because it's a huge decision. And we're talking about uh, undergraduate level, graduate level, postgrad. We need to be, especially now, um, we need to be very focused on why we're going to a certain place and how that place can really create that value for me as the consumer or user or however we want to call it, the student in the end. Um, how is that place helping me? And I think from an institutional perspective, this is really helpful because you can talk for hours as an admissions counselor about how great your school is and how great your programs are, but really the best ambassadors are people who have actually already studied there and who have seen success once they've graduated and they can talk about how the degree from that institution has helped them to, to get to where they are. And so I, from an institutional perspective, I see a lot of value in this because mm -hmm. it's it's really amplifying the work that the admissions counselors are, are trying to yeah. do. Yeah, and just to add on top of that, I mean, this specific example was the student saying how important her her dry psychometrics course was when she actually got into Peloton and was actually working at Peloton. That's like, oh, that course was very, very useful in my actual job. So then I've got a 20 minute video interview I just don't have time to show the whole thing, even in a one hour online information session. And I never show that piece. So here it is. That piece is in there. It's probably the most powerful piece of this video. Yep. And that's exactly it. And what I'll say to both of these, both of these things is we are trying to really combine even the research that shows that people do care about the outcomes, but they care about them in an individualized way. And then they care about the relevant, almost anecdotal, but relevant insights that these alumni can provide. And so even if it's an insight about uh, this specific course or whether if it's an insight, uh, insight about something else, they do care about those because outcomes are the number one thing that people care about when they when they enroll somewhere. Yeah, it's great that you know there's a great cafeteria and all of that. I'm not putting anything. It's it's all one one thing that it's, it's a combination of things that always makes the final decision. But the outcomes are a huge part of it. And what we are striving to do and what we do do is uh, we curate those. We individualize that because that's also tied to research, maybe even common sense that. Uh, people, especially now in the in the TikTok era, even though I'm not a TikTok user, but uh, all of those algorithms and 
all of the all of the services that they're getting outside of their um, higher ed experience are extremely individualized and they are used to that and that's what we're trying to provide here as well through this yeah and this is an actual individualized web page for each enrollee each person who's been accepted that you're trying to make sure that they finish everything and get their i20 and get their visa and actually come and study with you so yes. they could go and look again, at one video yeah. on one day and go back the next day and look at another video they don't have to the Absolutely. problem was always they're not going to sit and watch a 20 minute video at one sitting but here they can and watch that, little three minute videos that's totally it uh, as long as there's there's that there's that content we can totally do that and another thing is that students at the stages of undergrad but even like in terms of in terms of their grad school or, or post-grad they are not sure where they want to go they are maybe sure in some things but they want to explore so we give them the opportunity to actually come back here and kind of play around with it so that they can have multiple various uh, stories that are relatable to them based on some of their interests but most for most of the students at the, these stages, it's not set in stone. It's not saying, hey, I'm going to study accounting, I'm going to do accounting, and that's it. That's not how people operate, I think, in general, and especially now. People or students or young people would say uh, they are not sure what to do. They want to have some kind of guidance. And I'm not saying that we're you know, kind of getting people to enroll at certain institutions. We're our goal is to get them to the right institution because that's that's the essence of this as well because on behalf of the institution we want to get the right students in based on our values based on our unique uh, view on things uh we want to get those and it might be related to uh grades it might be related to i don't know extracurricular activities what what uh, what have you but we want to make sure that there's a fit and this also kind of uh, helps that because we want to have the fit work from both sides. Yeah, and a, a good fit means a happy student and a happy student means a graduate of the institution. Absolutely, retention numbers, all of it. So yeah. that's that's kind of where we've, we really focus, we're very laser focused on, on the enrollment yield because that's where we do the best job. Um, I'll basically say, uh, when somebody is on the fence, some students are on the fence, this is a great tool to actually help them kind of navigate their journey a little bit better. But at the end of the day, it is about the right fit for both the student and the whole family and the institution, because then everybody's at least should uh, play the long game. And we the long game means, okay, you're not only enrolling, but you're also graduating. And then you're a successful alum and you can be a great, uh, even maybe even through through Harpier, you can be a great ambassador or steward of what we're doing here uh, at our institution. So how are you reaching out to the alumni? Well, first, I looked at your alumni questionnaire and the one question that jumped out at me is, uh, would you like to give back to your university without giving us money? That's, Which is uh, the perfect question because I think 80% of alumni want to hear that question. How can I give back to my university without giving money? <laughs> so no, that was a perfect and you're, question. You're absolutely, you're absolutely right. And we can actually go through the, uh, the overview of, of the alumni uh, onboarding experience as well. But the, the core of it is, and you're both alumni, and uh, people who are listening to this are most likely going to be alumni, at least from one institution, if not more. And uh, the alumni experience in general, and I'm, there's obviously exceptions, but is not a great experience. And the reason is that it's not that the advancement officers are you know, not good at their jobs or they don't care. They actually do care. That's what we were talking about with the analogy of Harpier when, when the counselors put everybody else first and them last. But there's only a few counselors that should manage thousands of alumni. And so then kind of the experience can deteriorate. And what we figured through a lot of research is that when I, and I've had, I've had hundreds of conversations with alumni, and when I asked them, 
simple question of, would you be willing to share your story knowing that it might help somebody and then dot, 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 uh, enroll um, at, at, our, at our institution or in some other way in the, I mean, there's been exceptions that said, yeah, I'm not right now in a, in a good frame in terms of my time. I cannot, but the majority say, yes, I will absolutely be glad to share my story. And I've been, I've been told this when I was navigating my career search, um, people like to talk about themselves and then think about that alum who gets a hundred messages, um, maybe a week, a month even a year, but a lot of messages, and uh, they are all requesting their time. Suddenly, both sides can win because that alum can give their story one time, and then it gets told in various contexts to the right person. But that person can also read the right story about somebody who is relatable to them, who can inspire them in their kind of next steps, whether it's enrolling in school or maybe further on when they're finding an internship or a job. So we're very much focused on the alumni experience on the back end. Uh, just to kind of say one more thing about that is that every single alum here that we work with, we onboard in detail and we know them. And we are not working with volunteers. We are working with stewards, with people who really care and they care and it starts with as, as, as simple of a of an uh, activity as sharing their story through maybe even a, answering a couple of questions if not maybe providing a full interview uh, and potentially even offering their time if they are willing to do that and we we enable alumni to do that through the system as well Okay, any more questions there, Nicole? Um, no, I think this is really great. I think it it has a double value for the institution because you're adding a way for alumni to get involved with the institution. As you mentioned, Jim, that's not just about money, um, but it has a value to the institution and it has a value to the alumni because as you mentioned, Robert, people like to tell their own story. And so this is a way for them to share that and give back to the institution that's... at the same time. And I think that's that's the added value. In addition to the work that this is helping with admissions offices is cre in creating those connections, it's creating that additional value for the institution on the advancement side and, 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 getting alumni more engaged with their, with their institutions. Yeah. And I, I want to add that. Sorry, uh, sorry, yeah. Th just that like right now I've been having a five week back and forth with one alumnus about doing one of these interviews. She's busy. I mean, she's, she's got a full-time job and she's busy. So it's been LinkedIn, it's been texts and we just haven't worked out a time to do this interview with a business school professor joining us so do you do you have like best practices when you do the alumni outreach to make it so it's not the amateur like me having the five week back and forth trying to set up just a single video interview uh, we what i'll say is yes there are best practices there are principles that we built the onboarding um on and uh, number one thing is that uh, every institution is a little different so we always try to ask a lot of questions before but as long as there's some let's say general needs what is always good is to be very clear on what the want is and where that story is going to be used so what we do is we try to almost tell alumni not a long but uh, a story about why we're reaching out alongside with the institution or why the institution is reaching out to them with our help. Um, and uh, so why and why now? And for us, mostly we, we do start with the, with the enrollment context. So we say, um, look, this is what we're doing. We're investing more time into the community. We want to get alums involved. And uh, we would like you specifically to be involved. And what happens usually is that the, the alumni get into this whole onboarding through an event 
or maybe through another alum that went through it. And uh, that kind of snowballs the whole effect. But where we really focus on is that uh, we give the alumni also a lot of outs so that we don't get into situations where it is dragging on. We do kind of uh, yeah ask questions such as, okay, are you willing to go and learn more about this or is this maybe not the right time? And we are okay with them saying no because there are thousands of alumni, thousands of alumni across multiple programs with multiple interests, with multiple uh, various uh, diverse backgrounds. And we can then kind of navigate the step in waves with them so oh, yeah there's yeah. there's a there's a whole playbook that we have for it uh but uh yeah that, that's actually a really good suggestion to. like i i assume then you say you give them an opportunity to say get back to me in two months or six months or yes. one year even. we actually okay. ask them ask them not for them to uh come to us even though there, if if this goes through a specific, because we have unique links for for unique institutions and unique groups within institutions, even um, so, we we ask them to if they would like, they can still use that link, or if we are able from our side reach out to them in three, six, nine, twelve, eighteen months. Uh, we don't do eighteen; we do three, six, uh, nine. Um, and then we, we navigate the next steps because we kind of manage it on our end. All right. Um, yeah, see, to me, this is a fantastic solution. This is a problem that's been sitting at the back of my mind for a while of all these long, long, long video interviews. And then we only use two minutes of this 20 minute interview or five minutes of this 30 minute interview. So, so that solves one problem. And then the whole back and forth with alumni trying to get them to engage. So the first time I, I met you and you had this question about, oh, would you like to give back to your university without giving them money? I'm like, that hits the nail on the head. It's like the perfect question. A lot of there are alumni, of course, who, who want to give to the university, but it's usually only when their basketball team wins. But most alumni, I think, would rather just give by sharing their story and, and helping the new students as they're coming on. Yeah, and the, this is this is actually, and I don't know how how we are on on time, but but this is actually a huge untapped resource, uh, or alumni as a group, they're a huge untapped resource who are mostly not super happy, and so everybody can win if a specific, well designed step is taken, and we are trying to focus on that step. We're trying to focus on spending that time with the alumni so that they can share their story so that we can then help the institution use the story with consent, with control of the alums. They really are in full control of what is shared, how it is shared, whatnot. Uh, but then at the end of the day, the alumni contribute, so they feel great. And the institution gets a huge resource, not only the story, but potentially even time, which then when you have 10, 100, 1,000 people offering 15 minutes, you have such a layer of, yeah, such a level of wealth that you can use for, for your own institutional purposes. And so that's that's mm -hmm. why we do, yeah, this, yeah, this whole in, thing. Internationally, internationally, you now have a database of alumni and you might actually find that you have eight alumni in India and three in Thailand and four in Colombia. Actually, Nicole would know this better than me. Like just before you travel overseas for recruiting trips, that's the time when you're thinking, uh oh, I need to find some alumni in India that can mm -hmm. help us, right? Mm -hmm. And that's another and thing. And then you, because, you reach yeah, out sorry. to the advancement office and, and they say, sure, but we don't know where they are. And so, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's, that's kind that's of a kind helping of... hand in that regard. Absolutely. That's exactly it. And and then like everything really lives here around that given person. But also the institution is reflected in this story very much, not only through the story, but what can be linked. And this is because there's unfortunately no no picture, so it could have looked better. But then the program that the student has gone through can be linked here so that everything is a closed loop. And in this case, this is this is the the specific program of, of uh, Turo, uh, and you can, as the, as the institution, really create an experience which works really well for you at the end of the day, but also 
the student and their family so that they are more clear in what steps they need to take. And then uh, I just wanted to point out that we also help with navigating the next step in regards of this whole experience. Uh, this one is simplify. This is just to calibrate the algorithm, but this can be absolutely and is uh, customized for the needs of that institution to point the users or students and the, and the parents in a, in a certain direction that they would like to uh, be pointed. And uh, and it can all also go all the way to yeah I'm I'm now officially ready to to enroll and this can enable that because at the end of the day that's kind of in the context and in the use case of enrollment that's the goal. Yeah, having a call to action is that Very final specific. important step. Yep. Yep. Exactly. yep. Because it took them right to a page that actually had a call to action asking them to sign up for an online information session. So fantastic. Yes. All right. I think this has been a fantastic session. Uh, Nicole, remind us again, how can people reach you? Um, yeah, I agree. This has been really great. Thanks so much. Um, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn um, via email. Again, my email address is my last name and then my first name um, at gmail.com. Um, but LinkedIn works just fine as well. Okay. And Robert, how can people reach you at Harpier? So I think the best way is is LinkedIn, uh, Robert Sovik, S-O-V-I-K. Uh, and uh, I'm also at, at Robert at Harpier.com, um, where I'm, yeah, I'm basically live there because it's, it's, a, it's a busy season. All right. So that's a wrap. This has been episode eight of EdUp International. You have EdUp. Nicole, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jim. And Robert, thanks for being our guest today. Well, thank you very much for the invite. Really appreciate it. Stay with us now, please, for the six minutes installment of CVS Education Insights with Jesse. Jesse's going to be talking about funding and the F1 student visa interview. So here we go with our first installment of CVS Education Insights. Thank you again for joining us on episode eight of the EdUp International podcast. Jim, I thought I wanted to start out my uh, first discussion today with my opinion or a suggestion about best practices when it comes to documenting student funding. Now, granted, most of us as DSOs, we're not financial accountants. We don't have backgrounds in finance. And we are not supposed to be doing a deep dive into an analysis of what type of documentation our students have. Nevertheless, our school should have in place, and I know most of us do, good practices for what we will accept as documentation of funding for our sources. The, the question I wanted to ask or answer generally today, however, is about some opinions that are out there that students are not required or do not need to take with them to their interview, their visa interviews, the documentation that they've submitted to us as DSOs for our review and approval when we prepare that I-20. And I, I have real specific examples of from students at their visa interviews who have been requested by the consul officers to show them at the meeting, at that interview, their documentation. So this, the consul officer will have the, the digital CVS record. And as we know from the Foreign Affairs Manual, that is the dispositive uh, record that the consul officer will be referring to. But they do frequently, not always, but frequently from time to time, ask to see the student's financial documentation that corresponds to what the DSO has um, uh, and ha has entered into the student's CVS record. And, I uh, have an example from a student who emailed me in the beginning of January this year, and she was quite surprised. And so was I, because in that case, the consul had asked her to see a copy of the scholarship documentation that the DSO had included on the, um, on the funding source side. And it was a, a scholarship from her home country. And it's not one of those countries that we know sometimes get subjected to a higher level of scrutiny. Um, by consul officer. So it was quite surprising. And ideally, in my opinion, okay, so I was I was involved with DSO, PDSO advising long before the digital world existed. 
And I thought, I always found it to be very helpful. And that was, those were the days when we, we were using eShip Global and FedEx to actually send uh, hard copy I-20s to the students. And what I would do is I would keep my, uh, my students' original I-20. I would also then have an original admission letter. If my student had financial aid, I would have the financial aid letter there. And then my job sort of as the stopgap person and my and people in my office, we would confirm that all the names were correct. Uh, all the names matched on the financial information paid in from the, the financial, uh, the, the financial award letter, letter, the admission letter and my I-20. And then we sent all those in to, to the student in the FedEx package. Well, we don't do that anymore, but nevertheless, we could still with our uh, communication to the student when we send the student the I-20. However, we get the I-20 to them if we email it or if we have them access it through the student portals. Nevertheless, good advice, no matter what you're hearing from different sources, that our students are prepared to show documentation of their funding that they've given to you in, in such a manner that it will match exactly the information that you as the DSO have entered into their I-20 when you prepared it uh, for their initial visa interview. It's, it's also significant, uh, by the way, because I also got an RFE for another student um, in, on February 24. And there, uh, USCIS has asked that student to submit all new financial uh, documentation and USCS and that RFE, they calculated precisely what the, that what the school's funding requirements are. And they told the student, your sponsor has to give this additional information. So very, very surprising to me that uh, USCIS now is also going in that direction and raising the question of financing from, from time to time. So nothing big and game changing from our point of view, but just be mindful of encouraging our students to be, to be prepared to have their financial documentation handy if in fact they are asked for it at the console, at the console interview. And I think what you're saying is even if there is an automatic international scholarship, have a letter saying that if you're putting the scholarship in the financial section of the I-20, then have something that's saying, here's, here's why there's this scholarship, even if you're automatically giving it to international students. I, I always emphasize my scholarship letters with my students, because that goes to this, the issue of the bona fide student and the big question of student, well, why do you want to go to ABC University? Well, there are many different reasons. And then they can also show I've gotten the scholarship as well. So all those things tie into the student's intention to come to our school, which are very positive factors when it comes to the council's decision to determine whether or not our students are entitled to that F-1 visa. So let's remove any obstacle that we can from a, an absence of documentation and let the, the students otherwise shine on their own uh, merits going forward in their interviews. All right, thank you. So everyone has just ed up with Cevis Education Insights with Jesse.